Well, praise the Lord. God bless you all. We are on a Thursday night. Can't believe it. We have made it to December 3rd, final month of this incredible year, 2020. And praise the Lord because he has allowed us to make it this far. Uh, and God bless you all. I pray that the Lord is continuing to bless you, guide you, strengthen you, uh, allowing all the good stuff to occur in your lives. And when the bad stuff comes, you continue to praise his name, knowing that he's going to turn things around at some point. If you're online, please um, leave something in the chat so I can know that you are here. Oh, Patricia, look at that. You made it right on time. Congratulations. <laughs> very good. Very good. And I see Lauren there. God bless you, Lauren. So are you guys able to see the questions that I posted? I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to see them from this end anymore once I posted them. Let me know if you see them. I put four questions there. If not, I'll just ask them out loud when we get there. I see some other people uh, online. God bless you. Please um, greet us all so we can know that you're here. Maria, Dios te bendiga. Buenas noches. So I've posted several questions online that we'll get to as we go through the study, but I want to know if you guys are able to see them. If you are able to see them, let me know. Okay, Patricia says she sees them. Fine. As we go through, you guys can share them uh, again so that they can be further down in the chat. What happens is as, I, as we go in the chat, as comments come in, it pushes it up for me so I'm not able to see them. And then I have to go up and down, but that, that's fine. We'll, we will continue uh, to, to uh, just share them as we go along. So God bless you all. There I see some other people came online. Please greet us so that we can know that you are there. And uh, we thank the Lord for allowing us to make it again to this Bible study on December 3rd uh, in the year of our Lord, 2020. And we praise the Lord uh, for that because he continues to bless us and guide us and strengthen us and just make provision for us. I know that the majority of us are just tired, <laughs> sick and tired. I want this year to end. Now, who's to say the next year will be better or worse? The greatest thing is that the Lord is with us, whatever the year is, whatever the time is. Um, God bless you, Eddie. Good to see you there. Um, what we need to do is praise the Lord and thank the Lord. Now, now some people go a little overboard and they start talking about, yeah, you got to praise God in, in the midst of all kind of bad stuff. Now, that's not incorrect. That's not incorrect. But they make a mistake. They don't want us to acknowledge our pain. They don't want to, us to acknowledge hurt <clears throat> because they say that you're not being faithful if you do that. That's as if you are, have lost faith if you say something negative. That's not biblical and that is not correct. Jesus himself prayed for God to, to remove from him what he was going to go through. And the Lord said no, that it was going to come to pass. And so he accepted God's will. We can accept God's will. That's important. And we should accept God's will. But the problem is when we do not acknowledge the pain that we are in and we try to make believe that everything is good or... We accuse other people of doing the wrong thing because they are in pain. We have to be very careful about that. Um, just this Sunday, I spoke on Jonah, who Jonah was hateful of some people that had hurt him and, and his people. He was against them. He was very angry at them. Who are we to say that he was wrong? If someone has hurt you, it's okay to be angry. There's nothing wrong with that. You can even pray that God do justice, that God take care of them, that God bring vengeance upon them. Hey, listen, you pray how you pray. The point is this. We have to acknowledge even negative situations, understanding that God has allowed them. For what purpose? Sometimes we're not going to know for what purpose. And sometimes we need to be very careful when we tell other individuals, well, God did it for this and this and this and this and this. You don't know. You're not inside that person. You don't know what they're going through. So let's be clear. Let's be very clear. This year is going to come to an end. I mean, in whatever way it's going to end, and we're going to come into a new year. Next year, as we come into that year, we need to be praising God. We need to be asking the Lord to strengthen us and to guide us. We need to be asking God to give us the strength to accept whatever comes in a good spirit, with a spirit of gratitude, with a spirit of thanksgiving, knowing that that year is going to end too. We are looking for a better place than this world. Now, that's not to say that you want to live well in this world. I want to live well in this world. 
But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the fact that God is in control of my circumstances, even when things are going bad. So praise God. God bless you all, Marcos. God bless you. Good to see you there. I'm excited about the Bible study because it's good. It's good to be in the house of God. I'm calling this the house of God. This is my foyer, but that's okay. We're in church right now. And so we can praise the Lord um, for that. So if you have your Bibles, and you should have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 9. The book of John chapter 9. And we're walking with Jesus. John chapter 9, and we're basically going to go through the entire uh, chapter. Give you a moment to get there. John chapter 9. Amen. So we've gone with Jesus through various miracles. We saw when he turned the water into wine, he healed the nobleman's um, son. Um, he uh, fed the 5,000. He healed the man that had been disabled for uh, 38 years. Those were four of his miracles. Anybody remember the fifth one? As I get older, my mind uh, draws a blank. I have to always refer to uh, <laughs> to, to the pages that, that, I'm, that I'm working through so that, oh, and he walked on water. There you go. Thank you. So he did those five miracles. But here we are in uh, John chapter 9. And John, I believe, only goes to about 21 chapters. So we're, we're close. We're close. We're halfway through. We're not going to make it to chapter 21 because that's not the purpose of this Bible study. We're only going through all of the miracles of Jesus while he was walking through the earth. It has 21 chapters. We are on chapter 9. The next, next week will be on chapter 11, which is his final miracle in the book of John. But as, as we're walking with Jesus, we're seeing that Jesus is walking along. And as he's walking along... He's healing people. As he's walking along, he's talking to people. As he's walking along, he's comforting people. As he walks along, he engages people in conversation as to what salvation means. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's not related to any of these questions here. A separate question. How can you share the gospel as you walk along? Just put it in the chat there. How can you share the gospel as you walk along? In other words, as you live your life, how can you be sharing Jesus? Please put an answer in the chat there, and we'll talk about it just for a little bit. So Jesus is walking along, and as he walks along, he's taking care of people. The beauty of the Lord. That he's constantly taking care of you and me and other uh, individuals. How can you and I do the same as we live our normal daily lives? What can we do to honor the Lord, to bring glory to his name, to present the gospel to other individuals? What do you do? If you're not doing it, what can you do? I don't see any answers coming up there. Make me antsy. <laughs> How do we share the gospel on a daily basis to other people around us? Okay. And he says, by being helpful to those in need. Yes. Very important. Being helpful to those in need. That's absolutely one way to do it. And what, and what, you know what Jesus added to that? He says, whatever you do, do it in my name. So you know what? You give a cup of water. Here you go. God bless you. Jesus loves you. There you go. You don't have to be crazy about it. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to stop them and, and preach the gospel um, to them and all that stuff. Because sometimes we get too caught up. And are we saying the right words? You know what? God bless you is sometimes enough. Patricia says, uh, we need to talk with our family, our friends about Jesus. Absolutely. Listen, if you have salvation and you can save others from going to hell, why would you not share that? What's the issue? What's the problem? You need to constantly be giving the Lord. And, and Maria says, by helping others. Absolutely. But it is by helping others. But what we do need to understand it is that it is by helping others in the name of Jesus. So we are helping other individuals, but we're letting them know, I'm doing this because I love the Lord. And I'm going to help you because he says that I should help you. 
Now, of course, there are other individuals who are doing wonderful things, not in the name of Jesus. I understand that. And that and that's real. But we, we as believers, as Christians, everything that we do, I do my job in the name of Jesus. I take care of this house in the name of Jesus. I do my gardening and I pick up those leaves and I do cleaning the street. You know what? In the name of Jesus. In other words, I'm going to do an honorable job, whatever the task is. The Bible demonstrates to us, and I've spoken about this before. Uh, we see it in the book of Genesis. Joseph, he was in jail, and he was such a, such, a, such a great prisoner. Could you imagine? That's an oxymoron, a great prisoner. He was such a great prisoner, he was actually freer than some of the people that were on the outside. He was The jail was basically given over to him because that's how good he was. In other words, he worked for the Lord while he was in prison. Never say that you're so tied up that you don't have time to do the work of God. That's a lie. That's not true. You always have the possibility of doing something that honors the Lord, whether it be with your thoughts, with your actions, with your words. We always have the possibility of honoring God. You know what, though? Don't get caught up with the emotions. I don't feel this or I don't feel that. Don't live by your emotions because they play with us. Sometimes you feel good, sometimes you feel bad. The point is that whatever you do, you do it in the name of Jesus. So as we're walking with Jesus through John chapter 9, let's get into the text here. So he went along. He's walking along after the previous um, chapter, chapter 8, some things that he did in chapter 8. He had a whole discussion with the, the authorities, with the Pharisees, with the Jewish authorities, because they constantly were getting at him. They always had a problem um, with him. And we're going to get more into that now in this, um, in this chapter. So he went along. He saw a man that was blind from birth. Now, if you're blind from birth, in other words, he did not see since the day he was born. And his disciples asked him a question. And I wrote that in one of the questions here, so I want you to get ready to, to discuss that. Rabbi, or that means teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And if you look at the questions I put in there, first question, why do people assume sin when something goes wrong? What do you think? Why do people always assume you did something bad because something bad happened in your life? I just want you to give me a, your idea. Why, why do you think about that? Why do people assume that? Somebody said, I remember uh, walking with a colleague one time. We were going to lunch, several colleagues, and I'm walking down the street with one of my friends, and she tells me uh, about uh, a lady's daughter who had died, and she had died young. And, and this is her this is her word. She says, I wonder what wrong thing the mother did so that the daughter could die. I thought that was terrible. My reply was, why, this, why, why did anybody have to do anything wrong? Accidents happen. People die every day. Bad things occur to us. All of Job's children were killed. The Bible does not say that they were sinning any more or less than anybody else. So why do you think? Why do people always assume that you or I are doing something wrong when something bad happens in our lives? Anybody want to take a shot at that? So the disciples, they assume the same thing. They ask Jesus, look at this guy's blind. Who sinned? He or his parents? Now that's incredible. He was born blind. How could he have sinned if he was born blind? Now they're attributing sin to a baby. Now we do believe that children are born with what's called original sin. They carry the sins of their forebears, of Adam, but they do not experientially carry any sin. Any sin. They don't know what they're doing. So we cannot claim that a baby sinned. That's terrible. Oh, I don't have any takers here. You guys scared? <laughs> Why do people assume sin when something goes wrong? Okay, very good. Eddie says that um, people are taught from, er from early, from early on, that sin brings punishment. Very good. That's, a, that's actually quite a good response. And so somebody might say, well, because somebody sinned, the child is being punished. But if we go to the scripture, the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, I believe, says, God says, the sin of the parent is not going to be on the son, on the child. And the sin of the child is not going to be on the parent. Everybody pays for their own sin. Okay. Let me see. I got a few answers here. Ah, okay. Okay. Naomi Morales, who is, who is that person? <laughs> My dear wife. She says, 
I think people get caught up in their own sin and they assume you are sinning too. All right, so classic projection. Since I'm doing something wrong, I assume you're doing something wrong. Boy, I know quite a number of people like that that are forever looking at other people's sin because of their own. Very good. It's like they look in the mirror, but they reverse it. They, they point it in the other direction. Maria says, because they believe sin is the punishment for their acts. Okay. Now it can be, it can be that that, that is a possibility. But but he, here, what, what's going on is this man is born blind and the disciples, they want us to find out who did something so that he could be like that. Patricia says, it's human nature to blame others for unexplainable situations. And that's very true. When something goes wrong, what, what happened? What happened? Who did it? Who did something wrong? We, we look for that. Uh, and Lauren says, scare tactics. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point also. Sometimes people try to scare other individuals that they, did, that they did this, that they did that, that they did the other thing. And you know, that doesn't lead to good places. So look at Jesus's response in chapter three, um, sorry, verse three. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. To put it short, he says, this happened so God could be glorified. What? In other words, this man, now he's not a little kid, he's a man. We don't know how old he is, but he's blind since birth. If he's a young man, let's say he's 18 or 19 or 20, something like that. Since birth, he was born blind. But God allowed it from his birth to that moment when he met Jesus so that God could be glorified through Jesus healing him. Now, we have to understand that is at that time, at that moment, because Jesus is walking on the earth. Don't go around telling blind people or deaf people or mute people that God, God is being glorified in, in, in them. No, this was very specific to the fact that Jesus was around and he could heal. So let's not, let's not even extrapolate that into, into the present. Right now, still, people are born blind or mute or, or, or deaf or with whatever disability simply because there's something wrong with our genes, because there's things wrong in our bodies, because things are not working well. But in this case, the Lord is saying this happened so that God could be glorified, which is interesting. The Lord singled this man out. And then he goes on, verse 4. As long as it is day, in other words, as long as it is day, as long as we have life, we must do the work of him who sent me. He says, we, all of us, must do the work of God who sent Jesus. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, night can be two times, two, we can take it as a couple of things. When Jesus is no longer on the earth, which, which he no longer is, he lives in us through the Holy Spirit, but he's in heaven, the Bible says, or when you and I die. What can you do when you die? Nothing. You're, in, you're with God in heaven awaiting resurrection. You're not down here scaring people. You're not, you're not an angel in heaven. Stop saying that when somebody passes away. No, because when someone passes away and they go to be in the presence of God, you know what the Bible says? That they're going to be higher than the angels. They're not even equal to angels, higher than the angels. The Bible says we're going to judge angels. So no, 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 no. When you die, you're not an angel. You're not walking around the earth scaring people. You're not like um, um Scrooge, uh, um, in, uh, like Marley in uh, A Christmas Carol, walking around trying to get into people's consciousness. No, you're done. It's a done deal. And then judgment comes after that. So we need to understand. Jesus is saying, night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He's saying, I'm here. I'm giving light. I'm brightening other people's lives through my existence. So we need to, we need to understand that. Now look at what Jesus does. He said this. He gives this speech. He spit on the ground. You spit. He spit on the ground, right? Made some mud with the saliva. So in other words, he spit on the ground, picked up some of that dirt, mixed it together, put it on the man's eyes. Could you imagine? Put it on the man's eyes. If somebody did that to you today, you'd probably clock him. What are you doing in the age of COVID? You're not going to do that to me. Well, you know what? Jesus did that. And then he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means scent. 
So the man went and washed and came home seen. Do you, you, do you get it? So Jesus takes this man, gives the apostles a lesson. Nobody sinned. This is for the glory of God. He spits on the ground. He picks up some of that dirt mixed with his own saliva, puts it in the man's eyes, goes and tells the man, go and wash your eyes in this particular place in the pool of Siloam. And the man went and washed and he came back seen. Okay. So why did, question number two, Jesus did this miracle in two stages. Why do you think he did that? I'll give you a moment to respond. Hey, Lillian, good to see you there. So this miracle of the Lord, I believe it's the only one that he does in, in, in a couple of uh, stages here. What was Jesus up to when he healed this man's eyes? He spit on the ground. He, uh, he, made, um, um, he took up some clay, some dirt, put it in his eyes, and then said, go and wash. So number one, he did that. Number two, he sent the man to go wash himself. What was he doing? What was he up to? What do you think Jesus was asking from the man? What was he looking for? He could have just healed his eyes directly. He did it with other, with other people who were blind. He prayed for them and they were healed immediately. What was he doing here? What was the difference? Come on, people. Don't be shy. Okay, Naomi says, he showed that no one had sinned and tested him to see if he would do as he asked. That's one. Two, Maria says, to see if the man trusted him enough. Number three, Patricia says, to teach his disciples that God can use anything to perform the miracle. But he also needed the man to go tell his neighbors about the glory of God. Okay, you're all, you're all right. You're all right. You know what the Lord was looking for? The Lord was testing his faith. Remember in the Old Testament, um, there was a, a man by the name of Naaman who had leprosy. He had a skin disease. And the prophet told him, go wash yourself in the river Jordan. And, the, and, the, and Naaman says, what? I'm going to go wash myself in that dirty river. There are cleaner rivers than that. And his servants tell him, listen, if he had asked you, you to do something great, some big accomplishment, you would have done it, right? Why don't you just go wash in the river? And he does it and he's healed. When the Lord asks us to do something, he's testing our faith. God wants to know that you and I are going to be faithful in the good days and in the bad days. You know what our problem is? That we are faithful, or should I say mostly faithful, in the good days. When there's meat at home, when there's a job, when we are able to buy things, maybe when we're able to waste money, God is good. And you know I say that all the time. Not to say God is good only when good things happen to you. When bad things happen to you, you better say God is good too. Because God did not cease being good because something bad happened to you. What the Lord was doing with this man was seeing if he was willing to follow through with what the Lord wanted him to do. And he passed the test. He went and he washed in the river, it says right there. So the man went in verse 7 and washed and came home seeing. He followed through. And this is what you and I need to be able to do. We need to follow through. 
We need to stop saying, tomorrow I'm going to get up early and pray. Stop saying it and do it. Tomorrow I'm going to read the Bible. Stop saying it and do it. Tomorrow I'm going to ask this person for forgiveness. Stop saying it and do it. Tomorrow I'm going to forgive this person. Stop saying it and do it. See, this is the problem. We get all excited. We go to church on Sunday and we get all hyped up and holy and all clean. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's all back to the same old mess. But then Sunday comes again and we get a little hyped up. We heard the sermon. We feel excited. I'm going to do right. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we go back to the same old thing. We need to be focused on the fact that God wants all of us I mean individual, all of our, our, our individual parts all the time, not just when we feel like serving him. It doesn't work like that. God wants us to constantly be in service to him. You know how Paul could say, be praying all the time, pray without ceasing? You know what he meant? That our minds are constantly in tune with God, whatever the circumstance. You are in tune with God. Okay, so the man went and washed and came home seeing isn't that a beautiful thing? He was healed. Miracle. Fantastic. Wouldn't the people around him be happy? Look at what happens. I'm going to read from verse 8 and keep on going. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. They recognized him. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he said, I am the man. And they asked, how then were your eyes open? They demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus, but you see, he didn't know him. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. So Jesus did the miracle. And this is the beautiful thing about the Lord. The Lord didn't wait around for people to say thank you. That's our problem. That's my problem. I want people to thank me. No, no, no. He did the miracle and he went about his other business. He kept on going. But he's going to have a conversation with this man later on. So fine. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. So to the religious authorities. Those people who controlled the temple. Because in case you didn't know, there are people who control religion. You know? And I'm not, getting, I'm not talking about no Illuminati and all that nonsense. Stop it. Stop it. We already know the rulers of this world those who run this world, the Bible tells us. There are, there are demonic powers. There are things in operation, but none of them can compare to God or to Jesus. So why are we so worried about that? It doesn't matter if there's a worldwide conspiracy of anything. The only person I need to fear is God. I don't need to fear any man or any woman. We need to be on top of the fact that sometimes we fear people too much and we don't fear God enough. So anyway, that's a, a side issue. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. So they brought him to the religious authorities. Now, verse 14. The day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. For us, that's a, a Saturday. That was the Jewish holy day. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. So they tell him, oh, so you were blind. How would you get your sight? He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. Could you imagine? You see, you see where religion can take us? Religion can take us to want a person to remain blind rather than have somebody heal them on the Sabbath. Because they considered the fact that Jesus made mud as if he worked and he shouldn't have done any work on the Sabbath. In other words, this man, for them, should have remained blind because the manner of his healing was that Jesus worked on their holy day. So that brings me back to the third question. The questions are on the way up, so I'm going back up to them. Can, reli can religion lead someone away from God? Answer that question. Can religion lead someone away from God? And, and, and it, I should have phrased it a different way. Don't say yes or no. Why can religion lead someone away from God? That's the way I should have phrased it. Why can religion lead someone away from God? What's the problem with religion? So they, Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. 
And the Pharisees, they're all upset. He healed on the Sabbath. He can't be from God. But others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. They were even divided amongst themselves. And the Bible says, I'm going to be preparing a sermon on this soon. Can two walk together if they're not of the same mind? Can two divided people walk together if they are not seeking to do things together? Well, we'll come to that uh, at some point in the next um, few weeks, maybe early next year. Okay, Naomi says, religion is rigid, but the Lord says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He is faithful even when we are not. That's good. Yeah, and religion can be very rigid. We're seeing the Pharisees here. They're like, no, nope, if you don't do this and this and this, you're wrong. Even if you heal this way and this way and this way, if you don't do it on any other day except the Sabbath, you're wrong. Very good. Patricia says, religion is organized according to the leader's beliefs and not the word of God. And that's excellent. And that, that really answers the question. Any religion that pulls you away from God is a godless religion. And Eddie adds to it, dogmatic teaching doesn't always follow God's laws. Yes, because dogma, as, as he puts it, and that's an excellent good word there, Dogma is what Marco says, the rules of man, rather than doctrine, which is the teaching of, of the Bible. But, and, but people play with that anyway, because they can play with words. You know how people play with words, right? Very easily. What we need to understand is that the right religion, the right religion is the one that honors God first before we honor anybody. That means that God is going to be at the center of your marriage, that God is going to be at the center of your job, that God is going to be at the center of whatever it is you do because you're going to honor God. How does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God. It always starts with God first. You know what religion starts with? Religion usually starts with man first. That's why Satan, I believe in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, where he, he, it is attributed to him when he says many times, I, 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 I will ascend my throne over God's throne. I will do this. I will do that. I will do the other thing. This is the problem with man-centered religion, humanistic philosophy, that it is according to man rather than according to God. And so if I am everything, I don't need God. And this is where this world is headed. And Maria says it also. These people or, or, or people who are religious depend on their own beliefs rather than what the Bible says. They have to be very careful about that. I don't care what the religion is. doesn't matter what the religion is. If your religion puts man before God, it is the wrong religion. And so you have to be very careful about that. That is not to say that there are not people in uh, almost any religion that are saved because they're seeking God and they only have whatever knowledge they currently have. I can accept that and I can respect that. But I'm talking about those individuals that twist the scripture, that lie, that change the truth of God's word to fulfill their needs, to get money from people. They fleece the flock. That's what that's called. They take all the sheep. They have very little understanding and take all their money away from them. You know what? I, I cannot wait. And I tell you this honestly until the Lord returns. Because even though I'm going to get my whipping, I take it because I want to be in the presence of God. I'll take my whipping. But there are going to be some people who have sold out the gospel for dollars, for money, for sex, for whatever they have sold the gospel for. They sell their lives. And you know what? They're dragging people down to hell with them. I cannot say they're not saved. I'm very careful about ever saying that a person is not saved. But a person who continually preaches lies Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I would have to question where they stand in the eyes of God. The Bible talks about them, that they are worthless, that they're like clouds without water, that there's a judgment reserved for them. Oh, I don't want that reservation because that's an ugly place that they're going to go to when they meet God. And you know what? We're all going to stand unclothed before the presence of God. And I, I got to tell you, I am terrified of that. Patricia says, TV evangelists. Yes, not all of them, but many of them. And you can see it. You can smell it. Even as they preach, you can feel 
what it is that they're selling and buying. Be very careful. Be very careful. So the Pharisees, oh boy, these guys were something else. Verse 17, they turned to the blind man. What do you have to say about him? It was, it was your eyes that were open. And the, man, and the blind man said, he's a prophet. Well, of course, he, he, the man healed him. <clears throat> the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. So they went, they, went, they went to look for his parents. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. They wanted to know the truth. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How was it that he can see? We know he is our son, they answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, who opens eyes, his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's old enough. He'll speak for himself. But they did, they said this, if you keep on reading the text, because they were afraid of the Jews. Because they had already said, you know, they have bad blood with Jesus, that if anybody said Jesus was the Messiah, they were going to put them out of the synagogue, which was basically they were going to excommunicate them. They were going to tell them that they could no longer fellowship with them, which would be a disgrace. Verse 24, a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind, who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. <clears throat> and th this is what the blind man replied. Now, the man who was blind, who can now see? Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And that has to be one of my favorite sayings in the Bible. I was blind, but now I see. You know that you can say that? If you were stuck in a religion and now you have been freed by Jesus Christ, that you were blind and now you can see, why would you go back to those man-made rules and regulations that keep you down, that do not save, that do not help you when the Lord has freed you? So if anybody's considering that, forget it. You were blind, now you can see. Then they asked him, verse 26, what did, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he said, I told you already. You don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> that was like a smack. Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. They couldn't even say his name. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And look at what the man answered. The man became a, a, an evangelist. He says, now isn't that, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from but he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this, were, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. They could not stand the truth. That he was blind and now he could see and he was healed by Jesus. Why do you think, why do you think that these religious people hated Jesus so much? Put your answer there. Why they hate him so much? What about him angered them? Put your answer in the chat there. And we're going to come to a close in a little while. So now the man is preaching to them. He's saying, hey, you guys, God's not hearing the voice of, of people who are in sin. This man is from God. He healed me. Now, basically, he's saying you guys couldn't heal me, but he healed me. Ah, it gives a good, uh, a good uh, response. They were all about position in the synagogue. Oh, that's true. That's true. And, and what would Jesus do with their position? Jesus would, Jesus would tell them, you guys are whitewashed tombs. And on the outside, you're beautiful, but inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Marco says, Jesus spent time with the outcasts, the poor, the sick, the needy. He didn't honor the religious leaders. Yes, that's right. He didn't honor them. You know why? Because they were not worthy of honor. They were not respectful. They used the same thing you said now, as Patricia said about the TV evangelist. They used the gospel to make money off of the gospel. The gospel is not to make money off of. The gospel is to give freely forward, to enjoy yourself in speaking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to give it with love, to give it with all you have. You know why? Because if you received it freely, 
How could you charge now to give it forward? We don't do that. Dios te bendiga, hermana Medina. This is one of uh, someone's online that I know from when I was a child in church. God bless you. Now I'm from Puerto Rico. So um, Maria says they did not believe that he was the son of man and he did miracles. That's right. But but there's a problem here. Not only did they not believe it, that's fine. Sometimes we come across things that we don't believe. Not only did they not believe it, they refused to believe it. That's different than simply not believing. They refused to believe in God. Anybody else have any reasons why they hated the Lord? And why religion can keep us away from God? Because boy, these people, what they would do is they basically would pull people away from salvation because they hated anything to do with whatever disrupted, disrupted their religious practices. They loved religion more than they loved God. And you know people like that, and I know people like that. And they're more than happy to recite their prayers day after day after day, the same prayer day after day after day after day that gets them nowhere. Patricia says, the religious leaders had so many rules that they no longer helped the needy or honored God. They honored themselves. And that is very true. You know what Jesus said about them? That they had, they made rules for other men to keep that they would not touch. Isn't that something? What hypocrisy. I can't stand that kind of thing. Well, people telling you what to do, but they don't do it. Now I'm thinking about my job, but that, that's a whole different, <laughs> that's a whole different story. They were jealous of Jesus. That's right, Marcos. They could not heal a blind man. So when someone came that truly had the power of God and could heal a blind man, they would do anything to get rid of him. That's how hypocritical they were. But let's finish. We'll go down to the, the last few verses. Beginning in verse 35. We're in John chapter 9, verse 35. So what happened? The blind man, he goes to the synagogue. He's talking to the people. He testifies about what Jesus has done. And they threw him out. And Naomi says their reality was exposed, but they still refused to believe. And that is, the, and that is true. Some people are not going to believe no matter what you do. Jesus heard, verse 35, that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? So Jesus went looking for him. Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. So Jesus tells him, do you believe in the son of man? Now, this was a real question. He was asking, who is this person? Now, Jesus would use that title, the son of man, in relation to himself. This is a title found in the book of Daniel. And if you've been reading the Bible as we have been, we're reading this now in the book of Daniel. It was a title referring to a son of God. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Isn't that fantastic? First, the man is healed. And so he receives physical salvation. But now he believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he worships him. And he receives spiritual salvation. The whole package. The total package. He got everything. Now, Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see. And those who see will become blind. I want you to understand that as we come to a close here. Jesus says, for judgment, I came into this world. You know why? Because Jesus came to bring a division between those who believe and those who refuse to believe. And we're seeing it every day, every day, every day. People make choices whether they're going to serve God or they're not going to serve God. Every day in the job, they make this choice. Every day in their marriages, they make this choice. Every day in the way they live their lives, they make this choice. By little tiny decisions that you and I make, we reject or we accept Jesus Christ every day. Now, that is not to say you are not saved. The Bible says that once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved. It is a done deal. But we live the, the, the conquered or the defeated Christian life as we continue to give in to our petty selves and refuse to honor God. Verse 40, some Pharisees who were with him heard say this and asked, what, are we blind too? So they were indignant. They were saying, oh, you said that we're blind? 
Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And that reminds me of what Helen Keller said. She said that the person with the least amount of vision is the person that refuses to see. And she was a blind woman. You understand? Jesus, in doing this miracle, Jesus didn't just do miracles out of happenstance. He didn't run into people out of luck. They happened to be lucky that day. As some people, they like to go to uh, Las Vegas and throw the dice and all that stuff and, and throw their money away. That doesn't please the Lord, but fine, whatever. Jesus met this blind man and he changed his blindness into, into light. He was able to see, but he was demonstrating to the Pharisees how blind they were because this man was physically blind and now God, Jesus fixed his eyes, but they were spiritually blind and they refused to acknowledge the truth of Jesus. Even though right before their eyes, there was a man who was born blind and now can see. So we need to understand that there are going to be people around you. There are people around us that it's it's not it's not that they don't want it, that they can't believe. It's that they don't want to believe. You know why? Because sometimes they're going to have to let go of some things that they love too much. They're going to have to hold on uh, to some some things that nobody knows about. And coming to Jesus means that they got to drop it. They don't want to drop it. So God bless you all. It's been my pleasure to be with you this evening. I pray that you have been blessed with this class. We got one more. The last miracle of Jesus when he was walking through the book of John. And it, and it is really uh, one of the most incredible miracles that he does. It is going to be the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. So please come. Come early. Bring a friend. Next Thursday, God willing, 6.30 p.m. The same channel. In this same place, we're going to be speaking about the resurrection of Lazarus. Incredible. So God bless you all. I pray that um, you have been blessed again by this class. On Sunday, the Lord willing, 11 o'clock in the morning, we will be in church praising the Lord, thanking the Lord for what he continues to do in our life, and just seeking his will. Um, there's a voice in my ear reminding me that we have Holy Communion um, this Sunday, so come prepared. Uh, to commune with the Lord and us together to fellowship in the name of Jesus. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night.